This is the Side Hustle Show with Nick Loper, episode 19. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your 9 to 5 may make you a living, but your 5 to 9 makes you alive. And now, your host, Nick Loper. Hey everybody, Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. This is episode 19 and we're going to learn about a unique work from home opportunity, a unique work from home side hustle that's near and dear to my heart, virtual assistance. Lee Drozak is here from myofficeassist.com. She's a well-known ambassador for the virtual assistant industry and an outspoken proponent for VAs everywhere. Uh, first order of business though, a quick thank you to UW, UW Kyle for the latest five-star iTunes review. He says, great podcast that makes me think about getting something going on the side like my parents did while I was growing up. I say, Kyle, what are you waiting for? Quick background on this side hustle, if you're not familiar. A virtual assistant is not Siri, despite how much Apple wants to hijack the term. It's a real live person that works for you remotely as an independent contractor. This is a huge industry overseas in countries like India and the Philippines with giant call centers staffed with low cost workers. But you might be surprised to learn there's a thriving VA industry right here at home. And many VAs are side hustlers just like you or started their business as a side hustle. And we're also not talking about a race to the bottom on price either. According to a recent survey, nearly 90% of VAs charge $20 an hour or more and nearly 60% charge $30 an hour or more. Ready to learn more? Okay, let's do it. Lee, welcome to the Side Hustle Show. Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a great show. Lee Drozak is the founder and chief empowerment officer of My Office Assistant at myofficeassist.com, a full service business management and virtual assistant agency. So Lee, take us back in time and kind of share your background. And have you always been an entrepreneur? Um, I have not. Uh, out of high school, I just started working because I was more interested in the money than the education. Okay. Um, got married, had my daughter, went back to work. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to be at home and that's where I kind of started my entrepreneurial journey. Um, I did go back to a full-time job at community college in our area. So I was able to get some education in there too, had my son and said, you know, that's it. I need to stay at home, but I'm not a sit around and do nothing kind of person. So I needed to do something. And I got into some freelancing opportunities where I, I telecommuted. And that was back in the days when you had to dial up to actually connect. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. So it was really, it was, it was, I'm really glad that it happened. It was a great growth experience, but that kind of put the bug in me to, I don't want to work for anybody else. I want to work for myself. But being in the mortgage industry, it became a very lucrative opportunity that I couldn't pass up. So I did go back to work until it just got to be way too much. Luckily, I left before the big bust. Okay. And, um, so I, was, I still had a lot of great contacts. And I just started freelancing again. And um, my daughter was getting ready to go to college. And I thought, oh, I got to you know, help her pay for this. And um, th- my sister said, hey, there's this thing called virtual assistance, which is basically what you're doing, but on the business end of it, it's something you should look into. And so I did. I started part time just to kind of, you know, bring in that extra income for, you know, for a two income family. And um, shortly after that, I decided we decided to move to a very rural area. And I thought I can't travel I, in order for me to get a job that, you know, I would where I would make any money and utilize my skills would be an hour commute. I was in a place where I didn't know anybody, didn't have any family. And I just, you know, couldn't leave my son all day like that. So I thought, well, I'm going to keep doing this business. And eventually it, it became um, I got enough clients and enough referrals that I took it full time. And in my fifth year of business now, I'm uh, definitely at the full time level. That's awesome! Congratulations. Thank you. I love the I love the story about like I got bit by the uh, by the entrepreneurial bug, kind of this work from home opportunity. Um, I think that speaks definitely to a lot of people. Um, so, kind of let's go back and so you mentioned your it was your friend that mentioned virtual assistant. That was the first time you've heard of this uh, business opportunity. 
Yeah, I had never heard of it. It was and it was actually my sister because she had heard of it from a friend and was looking into doing it. Okay. And so I thought, well, this is great um, because I can utilize all my skills. Because at that time, it was mostly administrative and customer service type things because technology was just starting out then. Okay. So it was, and I thought, well, I'm qualified to do it because, you know, I've been in an office environment forever. Uh, I was in management, so certainly I can run that end of the business. It's just, you know, okay, now I got to learn how to actually run a business. So I had the skill set. Um, I had the, you know, I had the inclination to do it. It was just putting all the pieces together. Yeah, there's a difference too between the, you know, the organizational skills and interfacing with clients, and then from being the business owner and having to like go out and and do all the business stuff as as well. So, yeah, I wish someone, I wish someone would have had told me that when <laughs> I started. <laughs> okay, well, let's uh, kind of take us back and say, you know, how did you land your first client? So you decide, I'm going to plant my flag and say, okay, I am a virtual assistant. And is it as simple as that to get started? It is as simple as that to get started. Um, you, j- you know, you need a solid internet connection, a semi-decent computer, and just the drive and the tenacity to go at it. And that's how I started. Um, I actually, someone had found out that I, that's what I was going to do, and they referred a client to me who was my first client. Um, and I did appointment setting and confirmation and just general um, administrative tasks. And he referred me to someone else. And then in the meantime, I had met a couple other people because once I decided to do this, I thought, well, I'm just going to put the word out there and see what happens. And uh, and that's how I did my marketing was just telling everybody that I knew, hey, I'm in business now. Okay. Did you find the, the initial clients were somewhat local to the, the Pennsylvania area, the Pittsburgh area? Surprisingly, no. My because I got the the first client that I got who was a referral was from New York. Okay. And he was a coach, so I had touched with a lot of different people through him. And once we had started, then his clients would say, "Well, tell me a little about your assistant," and then he would refer them to me. So it was it, it worked out to be uh, I fell into the perfect client for my first. Wow, client. that's great. That's great. Did you have a, a website or anything? Anything at that point? I had I would just started to put one up. It was pretty sad as far as <laughs> websites go. I think that's um, everyone's it, first website you know, story. It, it, <laughs> yeah, it had the information there because back then WordPress wasn't anywhere near what it is now, so it wasn't very easy to put a website up. Luckily, I knew coding and HTML, so I was able to put mine up, and you know it wasn't it wasn't pretty, but it was up. Okay. And, um, you know, just went from there. But you didn't with with the different avenues that are out there today. You do not need a website to start as a virtual assistant. Okay, so just kind of working the network, um, and that's kind of been a common story on past episodes of this. Working the network is kind of the best way to find your first clients, and not necessarily pitching your friends. But hey, if you know anybody, this is what um, uh, this is what I'm up to, and uh, you know, I appreciate you passing the word along. Um, so it started part time, and about how many hours a week were you doing uh, initially? Initially, I was doing about five to ten a week. Okay. And that kind of grew from there as the referrals uh, started to come in? Yeah, it grew from there. Um, I tried to stay under, I tried to stay under 20 hours a week because I didn't, I just at that point wasn't ready to be full time. So I really tried to stay around the 10, 15 hour a week mark. Okay. Now, um, so nowadays, are you doing anything differently with marketing or does it still come primarily from referrals? My my marketing now. I mean, I'm I'm active on social media. Um, I don't do as many local networking events. I try now to go to different conferences because when I network, I try to do. I'm real big on professional development and education, so I'll try to work the two together and go to different areas just to meet different people and find out what's going on in the world outside. Okay. Are there any big like virtual assistant uh, conferences? Like everyone kind of gets out of their home office and, and comes and uh, gathers in Vegas or something? 
Yeah, there is. Um, IBAA actually has a big one every year and they go different. It's different places. Last year, I think it was, um, or no, this year it was East Coast. Last year it was West Coast. They kind of float all over the United States. There are some little cells that, that come on, but I really now... I try and go to um, to things that are in my target market and not necessarily strictly for virtual assistants because I'm at that I'm at that area of my business where I need to know what's going on in the outside world to to stay ahead. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, if you're doing kind of uh, you know WordPress and technical stuff, you know, to keep up with the industry versus kind of um, burrowing down in your in your in your hole and you know doing doing what you know. Right. So uh, you mentioned IVAA is the International uh, Virtual Assistant or- Association. Am I getting that right? Okay. Yeah. And is that a so that's kind of the industry trade group? Is there? That's that's the industry trade group. But there is the there. I belong to a forum, and it's a it's a very large forum. It's a free forum. It's uh, virtualassistantforums.com. It's run by Testrian, who was a virtual assistant. And just wanted to kind of give back to the community. So several years ago, she just put this little forum together. It has grown by leaps and bounds. Um, She now has a storefront where she screens um, products that benefit virtual assistants or someone who's trying to get into the business. She screens those. So you know you're getting a quality product if you're going to buy something and if this is something that you're interested in. She also wrote an ebook and from that she started this jump start class, which is a six week class. I am one of the teachers for that or I was one of the teachers okay. for that actually working on something else so there's a free forum out there that you can get a lot of information you can make a lot of contacts and you can kind of get a feel for what's going on in the industry and not have to outlay any money okay great resource great resource um so when you're first starting out how do you know or how did you determine how much to charge like how much is your is your time worth in for for certain skills when I first started out, I charged ridiculously low. <laughs> I mean, because it was a new industry, there was there was really no standard. Um, but if you're going to charge, I would say look at the value of the service you're providing, not just the service, because everybody thinks everybody looks at the five hour quote unquote five dollar an hour virtual assistant, but realistically, that's not a viable comparison. So you really have to look at what you're offering. If you're offering, you know, basic customer service or administration, you're obviously not going to get as much as a technical virtual assistant, and it runs the gamut from twenty dollars an hour up to you know seventy five eighty dollars an hour oh, depending wow. on your skill set okay so it, yeah at, at that rate can be a very very lucrative side hustle yes absolutely um, so is it a case of starting out low to kind of build up a client base and portfolio I imagine though in that case it might be hard to raise the rates later on if people are kind of expect to be grandfathered in at, at the intro price yeah, I that's what I did when I started and it was really hard. I mean, fortunately for me, I was able to as I kept getting referrals, I was able to up my my price there and then I up my skill set too. So, okay. I was able to do that very easily, but if it's someone starting out, you know, do some comparison shopping, look at what other people are charging in both your target market, your area because you don't want to lowball yourself for two reasons is one, then you look like you're either new and just starting out and don't know what you're doing or that you don't look, you're just undervaluing yourself and people are coming to virtual assistants. It's like that big executive assistant for the president. They want you for your knowledge, expertise, and to know that things are going to run the way that they're not running now in their business. Right. I know when I'm uh, looking on Elance for, you know, for freelance help, I tend to eliminate the outliers, both both low and high. Um, if somebody is too low, it's almost a red flag. Hey, maybe you didn't understand the requirements and something. It's like as, as much as I would love to get this bargain basement deal, you know, it, it usually ends up costing more in the long run. Right. So I think that's cool. A lot of flexibility on pricing and it's basically, uh, you know, a free free market to put whatever price tag you want on it. 
is it so it's typically billed on an hourly basis or do you put together like um like retainer packages kind of curious how um different people might structure that um i used to do hourly but now i do retainer packages because one it's just easier um on my business to invoice with the retainer package and I know that um, I have those hours set aside and that they're paid for. And with the, the the technical work that I do, it does seem like the package pricing is best for that, you know, especially for website design and general maintenance. But a lot, there's a lot that that do per hour. Um, a lot of what the standard is usually is there's a per hour rate, which is just a tad higher than the retainer rate. So that if somebody only needs a couple hours here or there, then that option is there for them. So there's, it's it's a lot of flexibility. It's just kind of you know, there's really no set rules to this game <laughs> in our industry yet. That's right. It's all uh, it's a, the wild wild west. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is kind of the uh, the misconceptions about you know virtual assistants because this is this is outsourcing, but it's kind of like near sourcing, right? It's, um, it's not in India and, you know, this is the four hour work week, um, you know, myth of the, uh, well, not a myth, I guess the people exist, you know, of a virtual assistant to somebody in India for five bucks an hour, like you said. And so, you know, here we are outsourcing to Pennsylvania instead. And, <laughs> and I think that's really, really cool and kind of keeping jobs local. And but I'm curious how you, you're competing or it's not, I guess you're not even really competing because it's a completely different ball game. But how do you deal with, um, you know, maybe the pushback from clients on, hey, these rates are are out of control versus what I can get overseas? Well, I just tell them that you're you're one, a lot of there's really not as much push back anymore. Um, a lot of people in the United States want to stay in the United States. Same, I mean, we're all over the place. Same with the United Kingdom. Um, a lot of it comes down to time zones. Because people want to know that you're available in their time structure and their time zone. So that plays into a, a big part of it. Um, a lot of people want to know, you know, the, the big requirement now is English speaking and grammar. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, that's, that, that, that's huge. Um, so there really, it, there isn't as much pushback at that there used to be like when the four hour work week first came out, it was, Oh great. We can go overseas. But see the people overseas got really smart and they're like, this is crazy because these people are charging this. We <laughs> should be charging more, which, you know, I mean, was perfect for them. So it, it's not as bad. And if I get somebody who says, Oh, your rates are too high. You know, first thing I say is, first of all, you're paying for my experience. Um, I educate myself. I stay on top of everything. If you want to, if you want to pay for that, fine. And if you don't, I can, you know, give you a couple names of some people who were starting out who might cut you a deal or be a better price. But at this point, it comes down to the value for the money, and that's my bottom line: is I'm providing you a value. If you want to pay for it, cool, we can work together. And if not, let me help you find somebody. Okay. Are there any other, you know, misconceptions about outsourcing that you've had to to deal with or overcome? The other one is is the confidentiality or the security, okay. um, especially with the services that I provide. You know, I have a lot of passwords and private information for my clients, and they need to know that it's going to be kept private and that I have stop gaps in place to make sure that I don't have any security breaches. Security, especially, you know, in the last six months, has become a big red flag with a lot of people. They want to know, you know, are, are you working on a public network or are you secure? I work on the road a lot and they want to know, are you using Wi-Fi? You know, I have a mobile hotspot that I take with me just so I have a secure network at all times. But that is another big another big thing with clients nowadays. Yeah, that's uh, something I didn't even think about. So that's another um, good selling point to uh, to justify the rates. For um, you know, for people starting out, interested in starting a, a VA business of their own, do you think it's better for them to kind of plant their their flag, maybe set up their own shop, or to try and join an existing service like uh, like a virtual or an EA help? I think it depends on the individual because there's a lot of people who are not cut out to be entrepreneurs. 
So running the business is just a little too much for them. In that case, they're better off to be um, just more of an independent contractor. You know, you can jo- we I see a lot of people who join the forums who don't necessarily have a website. Um, they make the connections and then they subcontract out with you know other individuals. Um, especially if you if you just want to do this, you know, maybe five, ten hours a week. Uh, and no more than that, then it makes sense for them. But the great thing is it's such a sustainable business that you can take it to whatever level you want. So it's just your comfort level. Being a business owner is a, it's a big responsibility and it's, you have to do your, you know, your legwork and get the clients in the door. So if you're up for that, you know, that's cool. If not, then you should really think about going to one of these other companies and subcontracting just to kind of get a feel and a flavor for it. Okay. Any tips for people who uh, want to like get noticed and get hired? I guess it's pretty competitive to uh, to join one of those. It is, and I a lot of people I do is I tell them you know what find find these there's there's a couple different virtual assistant networks out there. I prefer the forums because I I the camaraderie in there is really good. Everyone is very very helpful. But just establish relationships with those that you're interested in working with. Um, I've had people come back and forth and talk to me in the forum. And then when I had a job available, because that's where I'll go there and put an RFP, and someone that I've already made a connection with, maybe not necessarily know their work, but made a connection with, I'll give them consideration before someone else because I, I've built up that trust. So just go and build up the trust and you know communicate with them. Um, just like you would, you know, any other networking, you have to network within the colleagues. It's not, a lot of people think it's really a cutthroat industry, and by some standards it can be, but if you find the right network, it's very helpful, and people are really nice, and they just want to see the industry thrive, so they'll help you in whatever way they can. Okay, great. That's a great lead into another question I had about leveraging your time. You know, when other people are essentially you know, offloading stuff off their to-do list onto you. And do you get trapped in this, hey, I'm just trading dollars for hours, um, but I'm doing it for myself. Is there a way, like, do you have other people on your team? You you mentioned kind of farming out some of the the work under different proposals, but like, is there a way to uh, kind of grow this business as it scales up? It, there is. I um, I was the worst person to take my own advice. I would tell everybody you need to get rid of that stuff and, and move forward. And I wasn't doing it myself. <laughs> I was so you know, so keen on taking everyone else. But if you really want to, and if you're going to stay small, it is okay, you know, to do it all by yourself. But if you're going to grow, you really need to get some help. You know, I have a girl who helps me with my social media. You know, she gives me a plan every week. This is what you need to be posting. These are the trends. Um, I have someone who helps me with my books. So it's just the little things that that I'm not wasting time on. I don't want to say wasting time on, but <laughs> You know, it's something that I could be billing. If I can be billing it, then I would rather hand it off to someone else, which is exactly what we tell people to do. So it's kind of practicing what you preach or else you will get sucked into this vortex where you're, you know, you might be working 10 hours a week, but only billing five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, I could use an assistant like that some days. (laughs) So the IVAA offers a certification. Like in your opinion, is that important in attracting clients or is that something that's worthwhile to invest in? I have never been asked if I was certified in anything in the five years I've been in business. Never. Now that's not to say that the certifications out there might not benefit you. I know VA classrooms has uh, many certifications and and coursework. Uh, Craig is a marketer by trade and he's really put together some good information. So if you're trying to build your skills, You know, don't hesitate taking a class, but don't take it just because you want that certification because very few people will ask you for it unless it's a specific skill set. 
Um, usually something like Infusionsoft, which is a high-end product, it takes a lot of training. It's just not something you can jump into. People might not, they're not going to ask you for a certification, but they're going to ask you what kind of education you have. So I wouldn't say so much the certification as the education. Okay, that's great. Yeah, it's more of, um, you know, what, what can you get done for us versus what badge do you have sitting at the bottom of your website? Right. Yeah, they don't, they, I mean, I'm sure they they look at it. Does it put, do they put a lot of credence into it? No, they just want to know that you're going to do the job. And, and a lot of times, and lately, I think because there's been, you know, there's as many bad as there are good virtual assistants. I've been lately asked, you know, do you have a client or two that I can talk to? Because I have my testimonials, but they actually want to physically talk to someone that you're working with. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think I can imagine how important those uh, referrals uh, or those references would be for sure. So what, um, so what separates the people who succeed as virtual assistants from everybody else? I think, you know, like we talked about, it's a really popular side hustle, um, you know, side hustle business idea, but like a lot of work from home, um, call them schemes or, or, or ideas, you know, more people fail than succeed. So what, you know, what kind of separates the, the good from the bad here? Well, I think the first thing is you have to be in that um, entrepreneurial mindset. You have to know that you're running a business. You're not working for someone else. If you don't go out and hustle, you're not going to get the work. And there's a lot of competition. So you have to really at the beginning define what it is you want to do and who it is you want to work with. Because that's going to make the difference between just bouncing from here and there. And, you know, just a lot of times when you just take any client, you you resent the work. And, and I know I, I did it. You know, I did it my first year. I was just so – I didn't care. They were clients. They were paying me. I was taking them. And it got to the point where I was like, oh, gosh, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. And I, I had to take a step back and say I'm not doing something right. And, uh, and that's, you know – Go and find support, whether it be a mentor, um, a coach, a, a colleague, a, you know, in the forums. Go and find that support so that you have someone to say, am I doing this right? Should I be doing that? Because it's, it's big, uncharted territory. And the other thing is a lot of people, when they find out you're working at home, don't believe that you're actually working. So you really have to set those boundaries. I get that. I get that every day. <laughs> what, do you really, what do you really do all day? <laughs> you know, like people are knocking on your door because they don't have anything to do. Hey, do you want to go have lunch? And I say, well, I can't. I'm getting ready to take a phone call. And they give you that blank stare on your face. You know, like I thought you had your own business and you work from <laughs> Or they think I'm in my, you know, they, I answer the door and they think I should be in my pajamas. <laughs> well, I, I, do, I do normally work in <laughs> gym shorts and stuff. Um, awesome, awesome. So, <laughs> so another thing, a lot of uh, the support, your support network is, especially um, in the virtual assistant industry, is going to be huge because a lot of people um, who do administrative type work or, you know, basic support type work, in a job think it is just as easy to do it at home and everybody around them thinks the same thing and it's not because even if you're not planting your flag and opening a website you're just kind of going by word of mouth and, and seeing how it goes it still takes a lot of work and you do need a lot of support so you need to make sure that your support system is on the same page with you. Gotcha. When you mentioned taking on clients that you really weren't excited about the work, what did you end up doing after that? Did you kind of narrow down the focus of the, you know, of your offerings? I did. I narrowed down the focus of my offerings. I remember um, Suzanne Evans, I was listening to her one time and she said, it will take a hundred people. You will work with a hundred people before you realize who your ideal client is. And I think I pretty much hit all a hundred of them before I knew. So you, by working with people, you'll weed out what you like to do. And there are things that originally I like to do. The organization side of me loved putting reports together and proposals together. And, and now I look at it and I just cringe because it's just, it, it, I did, I did it so much. I didn't want to do it anymore. So you need to recognize what it is you like to do, what it is you want to do every day and then how to weed out what you don't and what you do. Okay, like I, I think that's an awesome way to stand out in a crowded industry is, is saying I'm going to be the 
Infusionsoft virtual assistant, or I'm going to be the WordPress, you know, maybe even that's too broad, but like, I'm going to be the uh, membership site virtual assistant. I'm going to be the e-commerce, you know, checkout process virtual assistant or something, um, you know, as a way to just differentiate yourself from the, from the masses. Right. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and that, that's where it comes into building your network because a lot of there's, there's just administrative stuff that I don't do anymore because I'm into the technical end of it, but I will have clients that come to me and say, Oh, by the way, you know, do you know someone who does email management or calendar management? Cause I need somebody there too. So I will, um, I don't used to subcontract, but I'm getting away from that. So I have a few more go to people that I'll call and say, Hey, I've got this client are you interested you know let me pass on the information so by building that relationship you know that helps too because you might not want to do something but somebody else might want to do it so you know it's okay to say no because that client will appreciate you more by saying it's not something I do or care to do but let me give you to somebody else exactly so what's next for my office assistant um, I'm continuing to work on the technical end of it. I'm actually in the process of rebranding. Um, I'm going to, I was a multi VA. I'm tired of the management, so I'm giving that up and I'm going strictly for the technical end of it the in depth WordPress and the email marketing and the product launches, just that whole, because that's what I love to do it. Um, I'm at a point now where my kids are grown and out of the house. So I'm an empty nester and I, tra- I do, tra- we travel in an RV. So it's, I'm trying to just do things that I have a little more flexibility that I can take on the road with me and say, you know what, I'm going to go away for a week. Let me grab my laptop and my phone. And that's off awesome. You work the mobile hotspot from the RV. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, and it's, it, that's, what's nice is I've talked to people who have, you know, some people have like an hour and a half train commute to work and they're doing, that's when they do their business. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it's such a mobile business that you can pretty much do it anywhere at any time. It's just if you set it up right for your circumstance. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Lee, thank you so much for sharing your, um, your experience with, uh, with this awesome side hustle. And before I let you go, uh, leave us with your number one tip for side hustle nation and then, uh, kind of drop, uh, drop a couple links. Tell us where we can find you online. Okay. My number one tip would be to make sure that you build that network up, get, um, both, you know, from a colleague standpoint and a client standpoint, you need that support all the way around. That's, what's going to set you apart from the crowd and help you not only to start, but if you, if you want to take it to a bigger scale, it's going to help you grow as well. Awesome. I love it. And where can, Uh, where can we find you? You can find me at myofficeassist.com for the meantime, and I'm on Twitter, Lee Drozak, L-E-E-D-R-O-Z-A-K, okay. and I'm on Facebook at My Office Assistant, and the same with LinkedIn. Awesome. We will link to all that stuff in the show notes when the episode goes live, and, um, and that's it for our show. Thanks so much. Oh, awesome. Thanks for having me. Great. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Hey, everybody, what do you think of the virtual assistant side hustle? To recap, here's the basic recipe. You have some skills, either from your current or previous job, or from your formal or informal education. Number two, you find somebody who values those skills. And number three, you do the work and get paid. Now, if you want to get started, like Lee said, the best place for free resources is virtualassistantforums.com. Now, I'm a member there. Now, I don't post as often as I should, but I can vouch for being a valuable and helpful community. And remember Lee's number one tip, build that network. It's a powerful piece of advice we hear repeated over and over again. But if you're anything like me, you don't act on it, or at least I didn't until recently. So let's do this. Super easy way you can start your networking. Drop in a question or comment at sidehustlenation.com slash episode 19 and let me know what you think of this episode that's it uh, for me this week until next time go out there and make something happen and i'll see you next week in episode 20 the big 2-0 thanks for listening to the side hustle show at www.sidehustlenation.com 